Sorry, what? How's your day going? It's going pretty good. I went to the gym a couple hours ago with a friend, and I've been playing some cello, hanging out with my dogs. So it's a good day. My Mondays you, are like my Sundays. I got you. It's your day off from yeah. school and everything. What did you train today? <clears throat> I did upper body. Like all of upper body? Um, I did mainly like lats and biceps. Okay, cool. So how's, how do you break down like your, your training generally? So usually, so I'm working with a trainer currently, so we have a seven days a week schedule. So when I first get there, um, obviously the most important thing is I stretch everything out first, do a little bit of yoga. Um, I'll probably do about 10 minutes and then I'll go into a core circuit. Um, today we did lower abs, so we had to do uh, full leg drops. Then we went directly into reverse crunches then we did hip raises and got it's kind of what did I, I have my schedule right here. Oh, my dog just decided to open the door. Yeah. We did um, some like low boat to high boat. It's, it's like a yoga ab thing, but okay. yeah, some of that. And then today um, I do a lot of like, the word is escaping me right now, but I'll double up on my workouts. So I'll do compound workouts. So I'll do okay. assisted pull-ups and then immediately after following assisted dips, but then I'll rest for two minutes. But those are, are you saying like superset? Yeah, exactly. I can't. My brain is like it's all right. It's all right. No, <laughs> no worries. It happens. I'll do supersets and then I did run a good rows with alternating dumbbell curls and then dumbbell curls to overhead press with um, some narrow grip lat pull downs. How so, long have you had the trainer? Um, about a month and a half, honestly. I've never worked with a trainer before, but um, she's one of my best friends from back home. I recently moved to Pennsylvania from New Mexico and she and I worked at the same yoga studio. And about two months ago, I hit her up and I was like, I think I'm ready to start training for real, for real. Cause I've always loved being in the gym and I've always loved fitness, but I was like, let's see how much more we can do if I get really serious about my nutrition. My tr nutrition was like the hardest part for me. So, so, I, so what would you like normally eat? You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that bad? Yeah, it was really bad. I won't lie. Um, I mean, it was mainly because I was in my undergrad, but I was teaching like 15 power yoga classes a week. So I would write it off as, well, I'm teaching 15 power yoga classes, so I'm just going to eat essentially garbage. I mean, I obviously did like my protein and everything like that, you know, my supplements. Other than that, I mean, I was living in New Mexico, so tacos and burritos. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was going to say like, like tacos or something, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to go down that route. Yeah, you're definitely dead on. <laughs> Is it, are you are you Hispanic ethnically? Um, no, I'm actually half Filipino, and then the okay. other half is Russian, German, and French Canadian. Oh, interesting. So, I mean, that's a lot. But uh, so I was born in Russia, actually. Like, okay. so yeah. So I moved here when I was about nine. So I guess uh, we're kind of connected that way a little bit. But I always say people are connected by threes. So. Sure, that makes sense. Well, because usually, like, it's it's always funny when people like. Um, and I do it too, like just say they're one thing. I think it makes it easier, of course, obviously to identify, but, but in general, I mean, like you can be multitude of different, you know, nationalities. And so, yeah. but anyway, um, so you say you started training with this trainer for like a month, a month and a half, you said so yeah. about, that. so you start, do you usually start off like your training with, uh, with, um, flexibility? Yeah, just because um, I a few years ago when I was starting to get into fitness, um, I would just go right in and immediately start lifting. And especially if I'm doing that with upper body, it's really dangerous because I play an instrument. I have to be extremely careful because if I do anything wrong, especially to my shoulders, elbows, wrists, I'm out of a job. Mm -hmm. So I, I go in and I, I definitely try to warm up at least a little bit just so I can get my little... My little muscles are my most important ones. So my little muscles moving so that way I can, you know, better control my big muscles. And I also hurt myself from improper lifting a few years ago. Okay. When you say when you say hurt yourself, like what are we talking? Serious injury or just like aches and pains? 
No, it was it wasn't that I tore my rotator cuff, but I was very very close to getting mm -hmm. to that injury. I just I was going full out, you know, trying to yeah. get my shoulders in shape, and it was just um, I can't. I was on the cables. Mm -hmm. I was trying to row forward, and I just. It was not good. And I kept trying to push on it. I was like, no, you're just sore. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And then it just kept getting worse to the point where it was starting to affect, like, um, my biceps, my elbows, and my wrist. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, man, I'm in school full time for music. I can't, I can't just take time off. So I had to take time off from the gym for three to four months. Oh, wow. So, it was, I mean, it, was, it was, must have been that serious. So yeah, that, that's what's that's what's kind of interesting about like injuries. So it's a it's a fine uh, line between you hurt like say you have a pain. It's a fine line between you saying, "Oh well, this just pain is part of the job. You know, it's part of the routine. You just push through it and keep going." And then, or this is like something that really needs to be rested. And it's very difficult to make that decision, especially if you're having like. Um, you know, you have those issues early on. Yeah, definitely. So, so, um, so did you? Oh, it's a, it's okay. You're apparently very busy. No, um, someone forgot that I have an interview, so I have to. <laughs> no worries. And thing real quick. My apologies. Uh, no worries. So, I'm doing an interview real quick. <laughs> You love sending those little voice like messages. I was like, what is this? This is a mistake. Yeah, no, well, especially because like um, the other night I have an hour and a half commute from school uh -huh. to home and and people on the East Coast, I'm sure you've heard all about it, but they drive like maniacs. So I don't want to risk it, especially late at night. So I'm oh, like sure. driving. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> Let's yeah. go. Yeah, it's they made it recently. Uh, so I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. They made it recently, like illegal to do like any kind of texting or anything. I don't know if that's all across the across the country or not, but it is here. I so. couldn't. I couldn't tell you. I know, obviously, like uh, being on the phone in Pennsylvania, like directly, mm -hmm. but I couldn't tell you about anything else. There's so yeah. many things I'm learning about living over here. So, what made you make the move? Um, honestly, my grad school, the grad okay. school I wanted to be in. Um, yeah, I lived in New Mexico most of my life, but I moved to Pennsylvania in July. In between, I lived in Dallas with my father. I wanted to save up money so I could do my master's degree. And so I did that, and then we moved out here. So what's your master's in? It's in cello performance. Okay, so... So talk about that. How did you like start off with playing the cello and everything? Was this something that you did like when you were young? Um, I mean, most most you know players usually are, right? Yeah, definitely. So I did start. Technically, I picked up a cello when I was eight years old in third grade. Uh, I lived in South Carolina. My background: my father was in the military, hence why all of the different places that. Right. I Moving to. I'm like, is there a place that you have not <laughs> lived? Because it's like every time you make you say a sentence, it's like a different state. I know, I know. I'm sorry. That's so, right. um, I lived there in thir from like second to fourth grade. So in that school, they were very encouraging with arts and music. And they said, hey, you know, this year, everyone, every single person has to play an instrument. So you have to pick one. And so they all, you know, got us, got the classes together and they showed us guitars, violins, cellos, basses, et cetera. And so we all got to kind of walk around that day and meander and like, you know, pull on the strings and touch mm -hmm. the instruments. And there was just one cello in the back of the room and I like wandered over to it and I was like, this one. And at the time I was very little. So the cello was taller than I was. So... I come home from school and my parents are like, what is this thing on your back? It's bigger than you. And I was like, I'm going to play a cello. So I did that for about a year. And then my father got reassigned. So we had to move to El Paso, Texas. And unfortunately, the school on bass didn't have a music program. So I had to stop playing for a little while. And he got reassigned about a year and a half later. We moved to New Mexico. And they told us that there was music in the public schools. So I was able to pick it back up in about sixth grade. And since then, I haven't put it down. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So it's like, so kind of like, what, what's your progression with the cello? Like, what do you do now with it? I mean, I know you, you, you're taking your master's, but um, you said that you, it's, um, 
you mentioned it as being a job. Do you like perform in a in a you know in a symphony or, or how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So right now uh, in my master's, it is required that I am a part of the university orchestra. So I'm part of the Westchester University Symphony Orchestra. Mm. Um, as far as the job part is concerned, so I currently teach private lessons out of my apartment. I have a whole separate room that's dedicated completely just to music, studying music and teaching. So I teach private lessons to a range of ages. It really just depends on the level. Mm -hmm. um, I also take on freelance gigs, so I'll play at dinner parties, weddings, mm -hmm. bar mitzvahs, unfortunately a few times funerals, um, oh. things like that. Yeah, so we do that. And then I do perform in a couple of different symphonies. Um, actually, this week we're performing a concert with the Burke Symphonietta, and okay. that's in Reading, Pennsylvania, so about 45 minutes away from me, and we're doing a, um, a program that celebrates Black History Month. So mm -hmm. we're uh, performing a bunch of pieces by by composers, people of color. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. So it sounds like all those things keep you very busy, I would imagine. Very. Probably don't have a whole lot of free time. <laughs> I literally schedule it in. I force myself at a certain time, like, put it down. Like, I'm a very type A personality, so I have planners <laughs> among planners. I have lists among lists. And I try to get every single thing done. But actually, this year in 2020, I've told myself, if there's something on the list that doesn't get done, it's okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. save it for tomorrow, reprioritize. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a balance, right? You got to be balanced. Because I'm, kind of, I'm kind of that way myself. Like, I, I like lists. I feel, like, more accomplished when I can mark it off. Yeah. You know? And they, they do say that there's, there's something to that about, like, about holding yourself accountable and making lists to take an, it's the first step to getting whatever you need accomplished. Usually people that don't like make a list, sometimes they're kind of wishy-washy, like they, you know, they, they might not, you know, get that done, but it does become like a, it almost becomes um, like fanatical. You don't want to become fanatical with it. So. Uh, yeah. In the past I have, I have done it to where I would have to kind of ease up on the list because once I would look at everything I did have to do I would kind of just freeze and mm -hmm. so I get really overwhelmed by it so now I'm like okay do you have time to breathe do you have time to walk your dogs do you have time to sit and eat a meal and eat it not just rush through it you know so right, right, that was right. definitely hard too because I'm definitely a doer but this year too I've noticed um, when I do get kind of overwhelmed I just start interrupting it with a lot more action to just start doing something. Sure, sure, That's sure. Part of it. So what's what's your um, end goal for like, you know? And I'm I'm completely like illiterate when it comes to you know symphonies and orchestras outside of just going to hear them. Um, so like, what would be like an end goal for for a cello? It's like, what would after you get your masters, you know, what would what would you want to do? Um, to be totally honest, uh, I want to go for my DMA, which would be my doctorate. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to teach collegiate classes and teach collegiate students. Um, and also just keep going on the side with having a private studio of younger students. There's nothing more inspiring than teaching kids, honestly. Like mm -hmm. their brains, everyone says it, but their brains are like sponges. And so for me, it keeps me humble and it's like, oh, I can really learn from this kid. You know, I taught one of my students yesterday and he was just so quick on the draw. And I was like, man, I need to be that open so that way I can learn that quickly. So doing that as well, um, after doing a doctorate, honestly, I really love chamber music, which would be like a string quartet or a string trio. I love ensembles like that. And then performing in a symphony as well, and possibly um, helping to create opportunities for underprivileged musicians. So um, I grew up, like I said, in New Mexico, and my father was in the military, and my mother worked a full time, nine to five job. So, I mean, I had a really nice upbringing, but unfortunately, being in classical music, it's super expensive. So, I didn't have a lot of the luxuries that a lot of other students that I'm around have had. So I really would love to set up um, like programs where they can be with high level musicians and not have to pay an arm and a leg to get that opportunity or have the opportunity to perform on a stage with a really excellent orchestra as a soloist. So that way they know what it feels like. Like that's always been 
my goal is to be on stage as a soloist and because a teacher created that opportunity for me I realized how important it was and I would love to do the same thing and continue the same thing um, for the future generations that's uh, that's awesome I mean that that's definitely you know some important work for sure um, how would you even go about get that accomplished because you know as you mentioned it's it's expensive so you would really to get in front of someone and you know correct me if I'm wrong but to get in front of someone who is high level um, and where money is not a factor I mean you would own you would basically have that person would have to do it like on a voluntary basis I mean is that essentially what you're thinking creating like a program where high level musicians would volunteer their time yeah absolutely so I've had experience uh, in New Mexico creating a 501c3 with a former professor of mine and one of my really good friends slash a colleague of mine, excellent violinist. And we had a lot of the same mission that I have is to create opportunities for musicians in underprivileged areas. So it is about getting the program started and you have to go through all of the bylaws and creating a program and also finding faculty that are willing to do that. But honestly, a lot of people who pursue, especially classical music, not just music in general, but because we're pursuing something that's so delicate, I would like to say, mm -hmm. find a lot of people will do it as long as people are interested in showing up. Like for me, I have no problem volunteering my time as long as there's kids there with a good attitude and willing to learn. Right. And like in Venezuela, they have a really amazing system. It's called uh, El Sistema. And they have like that orchestra, if you just look it up on YouTube, it's got over a hundred kids in it and everything is on volunteer basis. And that's in one of the mm -hmm. most politically, um, what, how do I want to say it? Well, yes. it's, it, it's interesting that you mentioned Venezuela because um, I was, I mean, they're not go they're going through a pretty tough time right yeah. now. Yep. So uh, you, you were saying, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, you said politically what? It's like, it's dense, you know, like there's a lot of tension over in Venezuela. So for them to have created a program like that, and especially where it's so expensive to get out of there, and then they make relatively little to no money, there's right. something beautiful that's happening with music over there. So it's like, if, if there are people passionate enough, passionate, excuse me, enough over there, then you can definitely, with all the resources we have, especially in a place like the United States, like you can definitely make anything happen. Um, do you think like classical music is kind of going by the wayside as far as like, you know, in our day and age, there's so many options on like music. It's classical is kind of, uh, I mean, uh, how, how, how much of a percentage of, of kids are now going into classical music, would you say? Like out of, I don't know, school, like high school, let's say. Um, it's a very little percentage, I'm not going to lie to you, and it does, you know, it makes our job a little bit harder, but the nice part is, like every musician in the world, you have to reinvent yourself and find a way to make it appealing to people, mm -hmm. and that's also part of why I try to mix in music with anything that I do, so I teach yoga classes, and at the very end of the yoga classes, especially for charity or special events, I'll lead a shavasana, which is the re the resting portion of the class, and I'll be playing, you know, cello music at the end. And you have to bring music to people in places that they would least expect it. Right. Because it's surprising, but it can also be a pleasant surprise to where they've never been exposed to it. And then they're like, wow, I want more of that. And then you've just opened a door to so many other people. I assume you play your cello music, right? It's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll bring my <laughs> little purple case and I'll bring my cello to class and everyone's like, what, why is there a guitar here? But then at the end of class, you know. Why is this guitar so up. big? I don't understand. Yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, sorry, I kind of trailed off there. But no, no, that's fine. Question, um, yeah, it 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 can be seen as a dying art, but at the same time, I think when things are dying, it's also the most important moment because then you can completely reinvent it. Like there's guys like two cellos that are out there playing electric cellos, going on tour all over the United States. And they have people who are, who love classical music, who don't really know about classical music, beginners, people in their middle ages, like they have a diverse uh, crowd no matter where they go. So I just think, you know, like right now is an amazing time for us to reinvent it and get people more interested in it. And like I said, that's where I try to bring cello into the most unexpected places. That's how you so get. You, 
people. So are not. you see, you seem like uh, it's probably something that you just need to add some spice to it, some more like modern spice. Like you were saying that uh, they play uh, the two cellos, they play electric and kind of. I'm sure their music is a little bit more like, I guess, modernized. Is that is that kind of how they are? Yeah, exactly. So they'll they'll play you know music from soundtracks, like they'll do stuff from Star Wars. Then they'll do pop right. music. And then they'll do, you know, they've done ACDC, so they'll even throw in a little bit of old rock music. And then in some of their concerts, they'll throw in classical music, but sometimes they'll do like, I want to say a remix on it. You know, they make it right. a little bit more, yeah, like you said, spicy. Yeah, <laughs> I guess you have to. Um, so, so like, is there like a, so um, is there like a band or a, a uh, orchestra that's like high level that everybody wants to be a part of in classical music or not really? Um, I, it depends on who you are, but you'll always hear either the New York Phil or the Berlin Philharmonic or the Vienna. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so those, those are like what people are striving to, to get to. Absolutely. And it takes, it takes a long time if ever for people to get into it. It's like top 1% of musicians. So is, would that be like also part of your goal or not not so much? Um, it used to be once upon a time, but honestly, I'm just happy playing in multiple orchestras and meeting cool people and developing cool projects with music. Well, it seems like you definitely are into teaching and passing on the you know the knowledge. I mean, from from what you're saying, it's it seems like that is the focus you know that you have, which I think is great because if you didn't have people like that, then then you know how would the next generation you know get that knowledge, and then how would they be able to build upon it if you don't have somebody who's driven teaching them? Because sometimes that's the problem. Like sometimes when you get in school, um, it's a problem across the board with teachers in general, but. Um, they just become, they're not as driven. Like it, they just, they're there, you know, they're there, they're, they teach what they have to teach, but there, there's no passion behind it. And from my personal experience, like I love history, but my, that had a wonderful instructor in high school that, that made history so interesting and you could tell he was into it. And, and that's what, you know, brought me into it. So somebody like you, I would imagine would definitely be able to pass that kind of feeling along to you know, other younger cellists and so forth. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think it's important just because it's it's been a surviving art for the last, you know, 400 plus years. So, you know, if we didn't have inspiring teachers all around us, we can't become them and we definitely can't pass it on to other people either. So yeah, it's sure. nice to be a part of something that's been around for so long. For sure. So how so how long is this all going to take you as far as schooling for for a cello? You, you're finishing up your master's. You're going for your doctorate. Um, you know, at that point, like, how long is that going to be before you're done? It just it depends. I have about another year left in my master's degree. I'm I'm in my spring semester, my first year. This program ends next spring. If I do decide to either pursue my doctor, my DMA, or what's called an artist diploma. DMA takes anywhere from two to four years, and an artist diploma is anywhere from one to two years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anywhere from two to six years. Okay. So what do they teach you in, in like, a master's program? I mean, like, you've been playing cello, like, all your life. What, what other aspects could they possibly teach you, you know, those higher levels, you know, classes? So right now I'm currently in a composition class. So they teach you, you know, in our undergrad, we have to learn all of the rules that go behind composition that all of the greats followed. Then we learn a couple years later, like how they broke the rules and how they developed new rules. And then now we get to see all of those rules being broken and how we also either want to follow the old practices or if we want to create new rules for ourselves. And also in our composition class, you, I was really nervous because I was like, I've never written anything for myself in my life. Like, how am I going to do this all semester? And the teacher is very guiding. He'll show you pieces and he'll make you, he'll ask you questions. And they're all very leading to like, how would you do this? Do you like the way this sounds? What emotions can be represented in your playing? And what kind of articulations or what kind of style, what notes represent these emotions, these feelings? And how can you put them into something that's about yourself? Like right now we're doing a self-portrait composition. So we're learning how to essentially compose pieces 
Um, I'm learning how to take auditions to win jobs, so that's definitely something that's very important. Um, I'm in a music history class, so it's getting really deep and nitty gritty into music history. And then, um, and then I'm taking a, a couple of chamber music classes. So I'll rehearse with my trio twice a week. Then we get a coaching from one of the professors at the university. And they kind of just show us, in the, at least in the coachings, they'll guide us as to what the composer was wanting, whether we're on the right track, and how to kind of think of things when we're rehearsing one-on-one, -on -one, just ourselves and our instrument, but also one on three, you know, with the three of us being all in a room and how we can all have a combined sound that also creates something um, pleasing for the listener to hear as well, while still staying within the realms of what's appropriate for that time period. That's uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It, it almost sounds like you're trying to paint a picture with notes. That's, I mean, that's, that's essentially. Perfect way to put it, yes. Mm -hmm. So how much pushback do people get? You know, so uh, with my limited um, musical history, I in, I find that from what I remember, any time that there were significant rules being broken, that there was a lot of pushback. Um, do you Would you get that during this time or everybody, it's kind of a free for all now? It's kind of funny that you ask that because you would think that with times changing, so much has changed that people would be a lot more receptive to having a lot more newer sounds and rules being broken, but you'll actually find that people do love the traditional. So um, there's a composer that I'm currently playing a solo sonata. His name is Paul Hindemith. Mm -hmm. And even I was not excited to play this piece. It's <laughs> weird. It's I've never played something like this before. There's no background behind it. The composer just wanted to see how far he could push a cellist and the, the realms that the cello can get to on the instrument. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's weird. You always want, you know, like Beethoven, where there's a story behind it with like right, right. overture. There's a lot of political uprising. But um, yeah, it's, it's really funny. You do get a lot of pushback still even though we're in such new times, we're like, oh, I, I didn't like that at all. And yeah, so we find ourselves having to balance introducing new music still and keeping the traditional music around, like, you know, Beethoven, Brahms, all of those. So, I mean, so basically, like, if you decide you wanted to go your, your own way that hasn't been done before, you can expect, like, maybe not initially not having the greatest response. Yeah, probably at first, you know, luckily I'm surrounded by really open-minded musicians at school, so they'd probably be very supportive, but mm -hmm. on a grander scale, it would be a lot more difficult. Do, would you, how would you get yourself, so like normal, you know, normally like musicians would like put out albums and things of that nature, as a celloist, do you, do you go down that route? Do you put out an, like an album, you know, a, a single album or something to that effect? Yeah, absolutely. So my professor has just released, I think, I want to say his fourth or fifth CD mm -hmm. with his trio. So we absolutely still do CDs and YouTube videos and things like that. You know, you'd think that a YouTube video would just be looking at someone, you know, playing a piece, but you can actually get very creative in the way that even that you the camera angles are set up, you no know, black and white, vignette, things like that. So that way you still can paint a picture because, oh, really? you know, music um, affects people differently and evokes different emotions differently. And especially if you set it up right, you know. So mm. there's, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. But we definitely do CDs, things like that. Uh, a lot more popular, though, is definitely Instagram, mm -hmm. Instagram and Facebook videos. A lot of people set up uh, Instagram lives or they'll do the Instagram TV and they'll set up their videos that way. Have you done that? I have gone live on Instagram, just kind of, my audience is a lot more fitness based because that's how I grew my following. But as of lately, as I get more serious in my degree, um, I've gone live on Instagram to kind of explain, oh, this is what I'm doing. This is the difference between this and this, you know, scales and repertoire, etudes, things like that. So that way people feel more comfortable asking questions because it's our job as classical musicians, unfortunately, a lot of people or a lot of musicians don't take the time to try and educate their friends and family. And for some unholy reason, people think that classical music is only for old people or really intelligent people. Uh -huh. 
And so oh, I, dumb people can listen to classical music too. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm just saying like I it doesn't have to be this crazy sophisticated style of listening. Like, so snobby. He, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's partially on us. And I feel like as musicians, sometimes we do get tired because you do go through such extensive training for, you know, 20, 30 years of your life that you don't want to take the time to kind of explain things anymore. You just get tired. But I think it's very important for us to do that because that's how we're going to get people comfortable in our audiences. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, if you don't have an audience, uh, you know, you don't, there's like, no, yeah. there's no reason to even do it. You know, that's, I mean, I guess there's personal enjoyment, but the majority of it is for, for you know, others to appreciate what you, what you've created, you know? So, yeah. So, so you said that majority, I think you definitely should like continue on with the cello thing on Instagram because, um, I mean, while you might have grown a you know a large percentage of your followers as you know in fitness, I mean that's that's a unique thing, especially someone that's involved in fitness and then doing things like classical music. I, you know, you don't find that too often. It's yeah. just <laughs> it's just one of those things. It's like yesterday I interviewed um, a girl. Her, her name was Paula, and she is a emergency uh, veterinarian, like surgeon. So she so and she's like into fitness. So I think it's really neat when you have like people that are into fitness but do other cool things. So I think you, your following would definitely grow a lot more, you know, with that. So that would be my advice. I'm not, you know, I don't charge anything yeah. for that. Free advice. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. And and for me, it's just been a courage thing because you know, like like anyone else, you don't want to put yourself out there until you feel ready or until yeah, it's comfortable. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, so that's been my biggest thing holding me back is is people giving you know unnecessary kind of harsh commentary on sure. um, whatever I can't I'm, listen to that. Right, but at the same time, it's like no matter who you are, how famous you are, how good you are at your craft, you're always going to get some kind of criticism. Mm -hmm. You can't please everyone. So I have been I've been posting a lot more videos definitely it, as of late, and I plan on continuing to do yeah. so. It's probably the other way around. You probably the more popular you get, the more criticism you'll get because there's just people there that you know hate their lives and want to put somebody down. So that's that's generally how it works. Um, it, you know, you can't listen to those comments. You know, it's and the funny thing is there might be somebody there that um, that gives a like a like a real good assessment, but in order to get to that comment, you'll have to read a bunch of nonsense and it's just not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so with that, with that and transitioning to like train, when do you find time to train? <laughs> so I recently had to tell my trainer. So before school started, I was trying to work, I was working out seven days a week. So five days of lifting and then I would have two, uh, cardio, it was cardio slash mobility days. So I could either do 45 to 60 minutes of fasted cardio in the morning or 60 to 75 minutes of yoga on those two days. Um, as of right now, I've switched it to where it's five days at the gym. My Tuesdays and Thursdays are insane, but I'm very lucky in the sense that I have four days off from school. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, I'm not having to drive to campus. Mm -hmm. So I'll just go to the gym in the mornings on those days. And then on Wednesdays, those are my shorter days at school. I'll either wake up super early in the morning and I'll go do some facet cardio or at night I'll just like dry slam some pre-workout and I'll <laughs> get it done. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, so wait a minute, dry slam pre-workout meaning like you don't take it with water? Yeah. I've seen some people do that. Does that actually like work better or no? For me it did and it gave me insane, you know, the tingles on my face because I used to live for the tingles. Yeah. Uh -huh. But yeah, I mean that worked for me. As of right now, I'm kind of weaning myself off of pre-workout just because it takes so much when you take it every day that your body oh, just no. have to sift through it. So as of this week, I actually went to the gym, absolutely no pre-workout. And it was very difficult, but my body's a lot calmer that way. Yeah, you got to be be cautious about taking too much pre workout or on a regular basis because then it's it, it, it well one it like loses its effect and then two you know coming off of it is is tough <laughs> like yeah yeah definitely, definitely. I'm gonna I'm gonna try that doing it with no water today I'm gonna actually do it like after we get we get <laughs> off let's yeah, see if that if it helps doesn't it don't you like choke on it is it how does it go down well, so. 
I'll have the like I'll have the little like scoop and then I'll throw it back with like a sip of water. Oh, I got you. I got you. So uh, are you still good to continue with the podcast? Yeah. Okay. okay. I just want to make sure I'm not taking up too much yeah. of your time. All right. So um so you tra- training 7 times a day is a lot too. Like did you feel like you were kind of like running down a little bit your body or no? You you felt good on it? Um no, I was sacrificing sleep, and that's one thing that I've told myself in the last couple of months that if there's one thing I'm not at all going to do for my body and for my learning experience is sacrifice sleep. So I, that's why I switched everything out. Yeah, yeah. sleeping is super important. It's a, the, I read somewhere that sleeping is like the most anabolic thing that you can do. Like uh, other than food, you know, food is probably, they said second, but if you don't get enough sleep, it doesn't matter how good you eat or how good you train. It it really affects you negatively. So, um, so you told me prior, we talked off camera uh, that you were thinking about doing a show. Is that correct? So what kind of show are you going to, you thinking of doing or what kind of division? I'm looking between NPC and WBFF. They're both doing shows, unfortunately, on the exact same day. So I do have to make a choice within mm. the next few months. But um, one's in New York City, one's in Westchester University. And I was considering doing the uh, wellness division. So I'm a lot shorter and I'm a lot more um, stacked, I feel like, in my leg region. <laughs> so I feel like to try to cut my legs in half, first of all, uh-huh. it make me happy at all. I've, worked really hard to grow my quads but (laughs) second of all we don't we me and my trainer didn't even know if it would work so the wellness division is perfect because essentially on top it's bikini and then on the like as far as your quads and legs and glutes go you can be a lot thicker and more well-rounded in the muscle area Mm -hmm. i I thought that and you might have misspoken did you were you considering bikini before um yeah i was considering bikini and then my trainer Mm -hmm. told me she was like you know you're you're a little bit shorter and she's like, you're a little bit thicker in different areas. So I don't want to cut you in half essentially. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that makes sense. And wellness is, uh, is the, is pretty popular now, especially now that that the IVB brought it into their, you know, into their fold. So it's, it's going to only grow. Are you planning to like continue doing this? Like you're going to do one, then see how you do it, do more. Yeah, that's what I was considering. I just wanted to, you know, try this first one just to give myself, I'm a very goal-oriented person, so when I have something to work for, it makes the work on the way there a lot easier versus if I'm just floating around with kind of nothing to do, it's really hard for me to stick to a routine. Mm -hmm. But um, I do want to try this first show and see how do I like the training routine, how do I like the meal prep, how am I going to feel, you know, when it comes to peak week and everything Mm -hmm. like that. And then afterwards, you know, we'll see. If I do more, but just for right now, I wanted, you know, I like to always try new things and, and well, just myself to do things that are outside my comfort zone. Well, the good thing is, is that since it's new, they're going to be really looking for pro, you know, pro cards to give out a lot of pro cards. So, I mean, that there's definitely the time to compete if you're looking to try to turn pro. So, yeah. I, I mean, it's tough when when the division is already well developed and you have to try to go through it. But it should it should um, should be a little easier, you know, because they're still kind of looking for what they what they want, what they you know what kind of look that they truly want for wellness. Even though like we kind of have a general idea, they're going to identify that as the competitions go. So does the W um, does the BFF do they have a wellness division as well? Yeah, they just announced their Diva Wellness when they dropped it on Instagram the other okay. day. Okay. So. Okay. Cool. Cool. So, um, and you said when is the show? July twenty fifth. Okay, so you've got a few months to yeah. go train. Yeah. Well, originally there was a show that was going to take place here in Lehigh Valley in May, but mm-hmm. after talking to my trainer, I felt like with going through finals week and those are like the peak weeks for performances i didn't want to have any extra added stress on on top of taking calories away from myself so we decided to have a nice long prep since it's my first show so that way i can feel really good and then in may june may and june i can really you know those are the most important weeks out anyway so i can really hit it hard and go back seven days a week to school what do you the gym <laughs> yeah seven days to school you've got school on your mind like <laughs> always 
<laughs> uh, so what are you eating now? Uh, you cleaned up your diet, I assume. Uh, yeah, definitely. So it's a lot of lean ground turkey, uh, lean steaks, salads, shrimps, quinoa, um, long grain wild rice, you know, and obviously all portioned out and then tons of protein, RX butter as my best friend and rice cakes. Do you, um, you do, do a lot of carbs? Like what do your carbs look like? Do you, do you do macros or no? Um, as of right now, we're not as strict on it. Uh, the most important thing is that on my active days, I'm doing 1800 calories. And on my inactive days, I'm doing about 1600. None of them coming from tacos anymore. No. And there no, are okay. tacos or burritos in Pennsylvania. You said they're not any, is no. that what you said? Oh, mm. well, I mean, it's I probably could have told you that. Also a bad thing. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, that'll, that'll be cool. Uh, so th you do like, so you said you do like person, um, for as far as music, you do like personal, um, oh, how can I, I want to say personal training, but that sounds like fitness <laughs> lessons. That's it. You do lessons. And so if like somebody wanted to, uh, you know, contact you, how would they do that for like lessons? Um, either my phone number or my email, Instagram, I can do anything online. So, so what are your, like, like, what are your, what's your Instagram? Go ahead and say it. Like you have, do you have like YouTube, anything like that where you think people might want to reach out to you? Uh, just my Instagram is the fat cellist. So T H E P H A T and then C E L L I S T. Okay. Awesome. YouTube channel as well or, or, no YouTube my channel, but it, hopefully this summer along okay. with the website. Okay. Cool. We'll definitely have to have you back on for that. So I think I've taken up enough of your time. <laughs> Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Um, I mean, there was just one one cool thing that I wanted to mention. That yeah, go ahead. Was the booty yoga that okay. I teach. I sent you a couple okay, of awesome. tips. Yeah, yeah. So, Bandana. yeah, just mentioning that for a brief shout out. That's actually what got me into my fitness journey. And so I started teaching that about four and a half years ago. So it's a blend of cardio intensive tribal dance mixed with plyometrics and yoga. And it's all done to like EDM, trap music. So it's really fun. And you burn anywhere from 500 to 1,000 calories in it. So when you say you do it, um, do you like you teach it or, or do you do it yourself? I teach it. Um, I'll take classes from my friends. And then if I can't get to a class like in person, I'll have to do it from my laptop. So there's a streaming platform of over 200 booty yoga workouts. That's including ab workouts. That's including sculpt workouts. So you're sculpting overall body. There's bands workouts where we do resistance bands. And then there's the 60 to 75 minute workouts that are online. And I filmed about uh, anywhere from five to 10 of those videos as well. Okay. So where, like, where is that? What's the, what's the website or streaming service? Yeah. Like, where that's... can they find it? Yeah, they can find it. So if you go on Instagram, you can look up the handle Booty Yoga, B-U-T-I, Yoga. And then the website is bootyyoga.com, and the streaming service is associated on the website. You'll have to download an app, but it makes the streaming really nice. Okay, awesome. Cool. So as I guess it's like focusing on lower half, I imagine, just from the name. Even – not actually, that's like – that's the one thing <laughs> all people were like, I know it sounds like booty, like your butt, but actually, no, it comes from an Indian Marathi word, which means the cure to something hidden or kept secret. So it's basically okay. saying the cure to anything that you're unhappy with, everything lies with inside of you. And we're here to open up this practice for people to like love themselves again, because with everything that's going on in the world online, you're seeing an oversaturation of things that aren't real. Mm -hmm. And people fall into a depression that makes them sad. Like, oh, I, you know, I don't look like this. I don't look like that. I don't have this much money. I don't have that car. And this practice is so much about just appreciating and loving what's inside of yourself. Mm -hmm. So, but it actually works on, you know, all over your body. There's tons of abs work, excuse me, ton of ab work. There's a ton of leg work. There's a ton of like, you know, shoulders, everything, you know, you get planks, burpees reverse burpees all of that good so stuff. it's like a full it's a full body workout Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. it's a good thing that you mentioned that because if we didn't talk about that i would have left here thinking that it's just for like butts that's yeah. it like because yeah that's a big thing now like that's a huge thing as far as like everybody's trying to grow their butt you know and so. it's, 
it's so funny too because I just you know and this isn't to you know bash anyone online but it just feels like if you already have a following you just slap a hey you know follow my guide and you'll get these results and it and it bothers me because it's like no there are people who have trained and you know do the work about nutrition and everything that have actually like gone through this to make specific guides and then there's everyone just slapping $25 on an ebook and trying to sell it online. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it it's it does it is kind of silly sometimes because if you look at some of the people that are doing that, I mean, it you would have you would have to really live in kind of suspended animation like to believe that this person uh you know, most of them is women, let's just say, had you know, is is got that from training. That you know, it's like so, a lot of that stuff is so obviously not gotten from training, but people will still believe it. People will, it's just like when, when I, I just did like a little YouTube video on a commercial I heard for, um, for a diet plan. And the diet plan was basically like, oh, well you heard you have to work out. You don't, you heard you had to like, you know, constrict your eating or whatever, like to clean up your eating. You don't, you can eat whatever you want. And I'm like, people actually believe this, but, but they make money off of that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's all up to the consumer, too, to do their research. So, and that's the thing, too. I'm always researching stuff because, first of all, I don't want to be uneducated and, you know, say something dumb. Right. And second right. of all, it's like, okay, like, where is the proof in the research that these things work? And it's funny because all of these glute guides kind of popped up overnight. And I was like, I can guarantee that, like, those glutes did not happen overnight. Like, there right. are people, especially, you know, I saw Nate Jones was on your podcast a couple right. weeks ago, or at least a week ago. And, like, she's been working for years to get her right. physique, and people just think it's going to just happen. And it's just, sure. it's just so sure. interesting. Yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah, it's it's like every time somebody just wants to have it done quickly, you know, it, it's quick, quick. And, the you know, the the funny part about that is that it's, those are the same people that kind of very get disheartened. So they'll start working out. They don't get their results quickly and then they'll, they'll be done. And it, you know, you have to be able to stick with it. That's why I always tell people that training, you have to enjoy it. Like I, when I, we, my wife and I first got married, she mostly did cardio and I got her into kind of doing weight training. And it's like, you can see, um, the progression of like when she kind of just started doing it just because I, told her to and then when she started to like really enjoy it and when you, when she started to really enjoy it then I didn't have to tell her anymore to go like lift like she did it on her own she wouldn't miss a workout you know so it's like once you start enjoying it and loving it it's like you know it's going to snowball into whatever results you want you have and all that stuff you know definitely so but anyways yeah so i Say what? I said, you know where else you should take your wife is to the symphony. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I would love to take her to the symphony. You know, I've um, we so there's a college here. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, Vanderbilt University. Oh, of course. Yeah. So we've been to their symphony a couple of times, and they're very good. You know, and we have um, the Nashville. I forgot the exact name, Na Nashville Orchestra, Nashville Symphony, something like that, and they're very good. But we don't go that often. You know. Maybe if we're uh, in Pennsylvania, we'll come see you play. So <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on. Um, you know, I appreciate your time and I hope and wish you all the best. All right. Thank you so right, much for you. having me. It was good to talk to you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.